how to do it works. All right. I guess I don't have to worry about monitoring the chat because it's just you and me. So we got that going for us. That's always a good thing. We're probably scaring people away because the first couple chapters are really review and their first couple chapters in Cooper are really review. And then when you start looking at the psych core guys, what they're, you know, all the hype for that too. But um, all we're really doing there also is reviewing and we're going to do a lot of philosophy tomorrow night and maybe some extra experimental design, but just a lot of reviewing. So I guess it's the topics aren't like, you know, really, grabbing but it's really important i've noticed to make sure we have all of our bases covered and not just you know make sure you know i got this or i got that because i mean i know i'm scared about experimental design and but you also gotta be care you know be cautious ethics can come up and get you and where we're at right now with the basic foundations and those foundational philosophies you gotta be careful too i mean I think I'm getting more solid responded and operant just by going over it so much lately because you think you know it until you really start to kind of dive a little bit deeper with that onion. But um, Mayer is definitely an easier read. I don't know if you've been reading along with me or just kind of going along for the ride, but Mayer has been so much easier to read. And he's very friendly. Yeah. I'm able to do my PowerPoint. It's not letting my stuff load. Never happens. Maybe it's my graphics, I don't know. A lot of what Mayer kind of started out with was really kind of going over like behavior, teaching, learning, those basic core concepts. And I had a picture of what a behavior kind of looks like. And then I, I want to really kind of stress out that non-compliant is kind of an overstressed word with education. You know, he's stubborn, he's not compliant, he doesn't want to listen. And those aren't really observable, measurable behaviors. You know, I get where they're coming from. I understand it. And I think I've really seen that more this year since I've been pushing the behavior definitions. Um, I really like how Meyer really broke it down. Is this something that organisms say or do? You know, we always think people, but organisms. I think the only people that are left out in behavior are plants. You can't really count plants organisms, human or non-human. Um, I like how he really pushed implies action. Um, yeah, the dead man's test is great. You know, we always want to imply that um, with a, if a dead man can do it, then it's not a behavior, but I like the action. Um, we're not worried about how the person looks, really how they're feeling. We're just, we want something measurable. We can see an action, we can paint that picture, and we know what's going on. Um, I guess the best way to think about it is all those terms that you hear from all your uh, consulting or classrooms or whatever that you know are wrong and you know what you really need, what you really need would be the behavioral you know, dimension or behavioral description. Um, when we look at behavior also, it's you know some things that we do um, or say or do but a response is a single instance. So we have that one instance and then we have a group of behaviors. <clears throat> I didn't like my pictures again. I don't know why it's being all grumpy to me tonight. Um, and then teaching, it's kind of funny because I'm a teacher and I started out being a teacher and I'll be 
back in the classroom this week thanks to COVID, but I'll be all right. I have to get get my learning, get back on that bicycle, I guess. Um, promoting learning by combination of means. And I really want to push that teach, model, reinforce. You know, Meyer did mention when we reinforce those consequences, you know, it's easier for us to keep doing those things. But when you show and you tell and you guide and you do all those things that teachers do and you differentially reinforce the behaviors that you want the child to do or client, then we start to have that trend going. I think a lot of times, you know, I don't know about other settings, but I think about schools, you know, we always assume our kid knows what to do. Our kid knows what to say, but we have to constantly teach and we constantly have to model. It's kind of like, um, the breathing and the self-regulation exercises, you know, I always tell all my staff is it's really co-regulation until he could self-regulate on his own. Um, self-regulation is where you want or to ma maintain that skill and generalizing in different settings. But we got to get there through teaching, through guiding, through modeling, through all those things. And, and reinforcing what you want the client to do. You know. It's not as simple as here's a penny board, here's a token board, here's a whatever board. You really gotta spend that time teaching and praise does work. I think specific praise and the data and the research to show that specific praise makes a world of difference too. Um, response class, I think this has been kind of a common term. Probably we don't have a lot of fans in the stands tonight, but that's okay. Um, Meyer also calls it an operant class. It's a bunch of behaviors um, that result in one specific form of behavior. Um, Rogue ABA really does a good job using the example of a bag of chips. And for some reason, my PowerPoint doesn't want to show my picture there. But um, basically, there's more than one way to open a bag of chips. Um, you can rip it, you can use your teeth, you can bite it, you can cut it. Mm -hmm. all these different ways of resulting in opening a bag of chips. Um, there's all these different ways of doing something. And that's a response class. Um, I live in. But then, at the, end, uh, but then um, at the end is you get the same result. Right. right that same result. I guess mm -hmm. the best one for right here would be uh, pine straw. You know, I could use a tarp to get it on there. I could put it in a wheelbarrow. I could put it in a little buggy thing, I could use a rake, I could use a lawnmower, I could bag it, but you're right, the same result, I'm getting that pine straw off my yard. We want that same result. I hope this isn't a trend in me having to <laughs> let it go, but I just was trying to throw in some pictures. Um, the three-term contingency is a, it's a staple for, uh, you know, it really is important. Uh, I think the more we've learned, the more we've read, four-term contingency is probably the better way to look at it, you know, because we had those motivating operations, the establishing, abolishing, all that great stuff. Um, I've really changed how I do data this year with my schools and my teachers because um, I've always done ABC data. We've always had the ABC forms. But unless you're trained and, you're, and you have that experience, and plus a busy classroom, you don't have the time to look for that antecedent, that trigger, that setting event. You don't have time to catch the behavior that happened right after it, that response to that antecedent and the consequence. Um, that's why this year I'm focusing on the behavior and how many times. I just wanna know, you know what's going on and I'll come in and I'll do the rest. I'll do the ABC data. I'll do all the correct data. Um, but just looking at an ABC three term contingency, this is a good breakdown for a lot of things that we do in our daily lives. You know, we have those setting events, we have those triggers that trigger a behavior, that trigger a response. It's really a response to those antecedents. And then our consequence isn't always punishment, it is always discipline, it, it's whatever happened afterwards. Um, it's it's a common it's a result of those things leading up to it. Principle of behavior. It's a scientifically derived rule of nature that describes the enduring 
and predictable relation between the biological organism's response, responses and given arrangements of stimuli. Um, it's discovered through scientific investigations. I really liked that part when Mayer put that in, that scientific investigations. Um, the more I read, the more I learn, the more I get excited about what we do and apply to behavior. You know, everything that we do is scientifically cut um, from the data to our functional relation to our functional analysis, analysis. And then you stop and look at our dimensions. You know, is it analytic? Is it conceptually systematic? You know, then we look at our our scientific understandings, you know, prediction, description, control. I mean, it all leads through scientific investigations. Um, we're trying to prove what's going on and whether it works or not, our intervention and what we're looking at. We're not in the guesswork business. We're not writing a grocery list of ideas and crossing our fingers that they work. We're in, we're in the science business. And I think that is not stated enough. And I think that I've realized that since I started this journey and that really caught my attention. Um, we apply these principles for the explicit purpose of shaping, teaching, modifying, and managing behavior. We are engaging in, there's that key word again, analytic procedures. Um, the shaping, the teaching, the modifying, the managing, they're all part of the greater plan. And it really makes a big difference. Um, are, are we making... I don't know, I can't, I just can't say it enough. I'm just gonna start babbling and talking in circles here in a second, but it just, it's really exciting when you start to look at things and how it starts to make sense. And I guess, you know, this might be the third thousand go around on these concepts, but you know, it, it's each time around, you kind of pick up on more things that you missed before. Um, it's like reading a good book, you know, you. We're reading a textbook. The first time around, you got it for what you needed. The second time around, you, you grabbed a few more things. But each time, you start to pull more information along the way. And it just, it makes it exciting. It really does. Um, environment is a really big term. I think it's also understated because it being one of our core in the, in the, the beginning ones. Um, Myers stated that we're not worried about, I use it in classroom, for example, we're not worried about the lights, the books, the desks and other things in there, because they're really just in that room. They don't really concern the context of behavior. But those environmental variables, if we can change them, manipulate them, that really helps our setting events too, being up, you know, with our antecedent strategies, those proactive um, ideas also. Um, it's just, Environments, another word that just kind of reaches out and just makes sense. That's another understated term. Um, you know, once we, I always tell my staff, we, we can, we move kids or we really redirect and we do all these different things. We're changing parts of the environment. Yeah, we learn through consequences. Yeah, we learn through those, you know, reinforcement and punishment. But to make some changes, we also, change our environment. Move you back out of the way, Carmen. Kind of my, my audience right there, I'm looking at. <laughs> um, stimulus, this is where it kind of gets into our stimulus class and all those different things. Um, a stimulus is a specific, specific event or combination of events that stimuli that in some way affect behavior. Um, this example came straight from Meyer. Um, kind of looks at the ABC thing along the way. We have our class, and then we're asked to do an academic task. That's gonna be our antecedent stimuli. And then we complete the task, and then there's our behavior. Um, that stimuli that led up to it. Um, this is a great example for, I think, several of some kids I've been, you know, working on some stuff with lately. Um, those academic tasks, they're a big deal. Uh, those non-preferred per preferred activities and that stimulus, it really does set the tone for that escape or that obtain. Um, 
that stimuli, it's a, it's a big one. And of course, we want that result of that smile or praise, a natural reinforcer. Man, I'm gonna do it on every one of my slides. And I had a great picture for stimulus class. Um, stimming, a stimulus class, and I was gonna pull up my past big exam because it had a lot of great examples of it. Um, because it looks at and surety, you may have to help me out here because I lost my picture because of Google's being weird. But we have the temporal, and there was another one. Um, is it like feature? Yeah, arbitrary and feature. Carmen, is that right? Arbitrary and feature. Um, yeah, I think it was. What it was um, yeah, it's um. Temporal feature and function and arbitrary is one. Right, because it's like if they um they all have the same common effect, like cats yeah. could be one, um, mm -hmm. different types of balls, different mm -hmm. um, like different kinds of vegetables, they all look the same but they're different, or they're different but they all have the same class. Yeah. So it, for vegetables, like let's say like the set of fruits. They all they look different, so they'll be considered arbitrary, right? They're different, but you they're grouped in, in the same category of fruits. Right. Yeah, and, then, and yeah. the more I studied it, it seems like it's response class is a group of responses that had the mm -hmm. same result, same effect, and then stimulus would be a group of stimulus. They're all the yeah. same or they're all different in some way. But they mm -hmm. all share some, 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 they all produce something the same. Yeah. I miss my pictures tonight. I don't know what's happening. Um, then we have respondent behavior, respondent conditioning. Um, this kind of hit home because I did all that study a couple weeks ago on Watson and Pavlov and kind of how it kind of came in there. Um, respondent behavior is that unlearned, you just do it. It's more reflexes, um, knowing how to teach you, knowing how to condition you. It's just one of those things. You just know that hot and you jump back. Um, behavior is elicited and then unconditioned stimuli presents that unconditioned response. Everything's unconditioned. And then we, uh, and according to Meyer, we have some um, that response conditioning. It kind of comes from Pavlov's work with dogs. You know, the salivating, we, we paired that bell, that neutral stimulus. It became um, conditioned and it generated that, the salivating part. Hey, Shauna's here. Um, I put antecedent driven because it, it comes from that response. It comes from that unconditioned stimuli versus operant, it's from those consequences. You know, hence it's learned behavior, we learn through the consequences. And then respondent would be elicited, it would be antecedent driven. And it took my example away from me. Google does not like me today. I don't know what's going on. And the picture all I had was it was um, Pavlov's dog. That's all it was. Um, well, the neutral became the neutral stimulus became the conditioned stimulus, and it just mapped the whole thing out. Um, but operant condition, like I like I kind of said earlier, then we're talking kind of um, some learned. Um, that's when uh, Meyer started going into um, reinforcement and punishment and all that stuff. When we as we close our chapter out. You really start bringing that up. These are consequence driven. These are behaviors that have been learned through consequences. Um, the basic process by which voluntary learning occurs. Um, it could be encouraged through various teaching strategies, reinforcement, differential reinforcement, stimulus change, shaping, extinction, the list can go on. But the key word is operant is condition. These are, these are learned through conditioning. These are learned experiences. Um, then, then you have operant behavior. Uh, same thing, just kind of a couple different words here and there. 
These are, you know, like we said earlier, these are controlled by the consequences. Respondents controlled by your antecedents and operants controlled by your consequences. Because remember, antecedent triggers that, you know, that, that, um, that event versus operant, which is we've learned over time through consequences. And I lost my picture, but that's okay. Um, positive, negative reinforcement. I think I've had too much fun this past month with um, positive and negative reinforcement. Uh, I've been doing a series at work to really kind of peel the onion a lot for my staff because of those misconceptions, because of those theories and those ideas of what we think positive and negative and reinforcement. And then you have positive and negative punishment and all those things too. But positive isn't, doesn't mean good and negative doesn't mean bad. Positive means we're adding and negative means we're taking away. So when you add reinforcement, which increases the future behavior, then we have, we're adding something to increase the behavior in the future. Then we come over here to negative reinforcement, we're taking away something after the behavior to increase in the future. Um, I got my pictures, it all worked out on this slide. Um, when we add money, or we add some kind of reinforcement, it increases that behavior in the future. Um, my stepson likes to do chores for money. He likes to do work around the yard and the neighbor's yard for money. That will increase his level of responding because he likes to get the money. Um, sickness, this isn't probably the best time of the world or the year to have a cough, cold, sniffles, or anything. Yeah, I get it all from you, Shruti. All of it from you. Um, negative reinforcement isn't bad. It's not bad reinforcement taking away something to increase that behavior. Um, when I did my series, I have all the videos recorded. If you guys are interested in those, um, those videos I've been doing with my staff, I have them all recorded. It's a four-part series. This week, we're going to go into negative punishment. Um, Hopefully, I don't think, honestly, I think it's not going to take because I had to be in a classroom. So I'm going to have to cancel that one. But the first week was positive reinforcement. Then we went negative reinforcement and we went positive punishment last week. And we really dig deep and used real world examples. Um, my favorite example besides medicine was school, was school suspension. Um, a lot of times we look at school suspension as negative punishment. When in real honesty, it's negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is we're taking away that aversive, that unpleasant stimulus. So if the child doesn't want to be at school and you take that away, then they're going to increase that behavior in the future. And then that's also a catch-22 for the teacher. They got rid of a, um, an aversive stimulus that child that was creating all these problems in the classroom they sent them home and that behavior will also increase in the future we talked about seat belts we talked about a lot of different things but medicine's a good one you have that headache you have that cold that cough whatever and you take that medicine and it gets rid of those symptoms um the seat belt in your car that loud buzzer um you're supposed to wear your seatbelt, but we wear it and the buzzer goes away. Um, our car has a lot of different sounds and noises that we do and it goes away. Um, a tire light or engine light, we get it fixed and it goes away. Um, there's, just, there's negative reinforcement all around us, but school suspension is not negative punishment. It's negative reinforcement. Um, negative reinforcement, like I said, we're adding something after the behavior occurs and we're going to increase that. Um, we're also kind of building up a habit through those consequences, through that operant conditioning. Gotcha there. Um, so we're not just adding something, we're adding something pleasant. And we're not just taking away something, we're taking away something aversive, something unpleasant. But the key word here for both of these is increase the behavior in the future.
I saw a lot of light bulbs when I was going through that with my staff and it was, oh, I thought it was this and I thought it was that. And I kept trying to tell them negative punishment works if the kids want to be at school and negative reinforcement works if the kids don't want to be at school. So it, you know, they, and they, and they'll say, you know, he came back to school and he acted worse and he came back to school and he did all this. Well, they don't want to be at school and it's not what they wanted to be at. So of course they're going to do those behaviors. Um, extinction. Um, extinction were withdrawing reinforcement. Um, with negative reinforcement, you know, that reinforcement is withheld. But in this case, we're withdrawing it. We're, we're not just ignoring the problem to go away. We're not just ignoring the child to go away. Um, we're going to pair it with something and it's going to be more successful. Um, you can't ignore bill collectors and they're going to and they're going to just go away. You can't just ignore your spouse and your that's going to go away. You can't just ignore things. Um, you're not giving them reinforcement, but you're going to have to do something else to solve that problem. You're going to have to teach a replacement skill. The candy machines probably is probably the best one of all. Um, here's a great graphic that I found um, for for punishment. Um, go back and you talk and you think about what we said earlier. Positive is adding. Negative is taking away. So now we have punishment. We're decreasing a behavior. So now I'm adding something to decrease the behavior. And now I'm taking away something to decrease the behavior. Um, when you look at those um, essay questions or mock questions or whatever questions they are, it's really important to stop and go is it, am I adding? Am I taking away something? Is the behavior increasing or is it decreasing in the future? Um, I'm a terrible skim through it, read through it real fast. But it's really important just to stop and ask yourself those questions. When we look at positive punishment, um, you know, I just spanking is what it came up here. But you're adding that and it's decreasing the behavior in the future. Now, reprimands is a, po is a popular one. Um, but does it always work? Um, threats are not punishment, so threats do not work as positive punishment. But we're adding something aversive to decrease that behavior. We're going to add something unpleasant that they don't want us that they don't want in the first place. I'm um, a parking ticket. Uh, I think a seatbelt ticket was was kind of my uh, positive punishment to start wearing it more, but actually was the kids. That's a whole different topic altogether right there. But that parking ticket, it got me. And I started, I decreased the behavior of not wearing it. Um, a speeding ticket, I guess it probably decreases the behavior right away. And then we have our resurgence. Um, but reprimands and the list goes on. We're adding something aversive and to decrease that behavior. Um, negative punishment. This is where your timeouts and you're taking privileges, you're taking items, you're taking things away that are desirable, things that the person wanted. Um, you're taking away the PlayStation because they want it. You're taking away the Xbox because they want it. You're taking away that driver's license. You're taking away, where there's also a catch. Um, in preschool or in most households, if a child is in the center and he's misbehaving and you know, things are going on and he's having an argument with another child and you pull him out and he didn't want to be there, that wasn't fun for him anymore, that's not negative punishment. If he's still having fun, still want to hang with his buddies, yeah, but at this point, it's negative reinforcement. You don't want to be there anymore. <laughs> They're getting on his nerves. So there's a fine line that you have to remember. Um, when you're when you're withdrawing from a desirable stimulus, that's negative punishment. When you're escaping 
from an unpleasant stimulus, that's negative reinforcement. I don't want the headache. Motivating operations. Um, these are antecedent events that alter behavior by changing the value. This is where deprivation and satiation come into play. Um, if you're hungry or you're not hungry or you had too much or you didn't have enough, I'm not going to dig too deep in the whole motivating operations, but for the most part, you know, this is our fourth part to the, to the um, contingency. You know, we always think about three. Well, it's really four. Those motivating operations in the beginning are important or just as more important. Um, if you had too much water, it's a bulging operation. You don't want any more. You had too much Tiger King and you couldn't handle enough of it. You have enough. That's that's one, that's your motivating operation or abolish you in this case. Um, if you're hungry for food and you haven't had anything all day, that's deprivation. Um, when you start using food or um, food items or edibles for reinforcement, you know how you do those or when you do those play a big part. Um, if I'm doing snack, if I'm doing um, edibles right for lunch. And they've already had food. There's, there's, there's no deprivation. There's no establishing operation. It's not abolishing. If I do it around snack time, or I do it um, in the morning time, then I may have that deprivation. It becomes more valuable. It becomes more reinforcing. Well, there wasn't really a whole lot happening with Meyer. Kind of the the awesome thing about him. He doesn't have a whole lot to his chapters. Um, I appreciate you all. Shauna, thanks for showing up tonight. Um, tomorrow night, Psychcore is going to be with us. Um, we did Scramble Design last week. We're going to do Philosophy this week. Um, we're going to dive into, um, well, really, we're going to dive into whatever our questions are going to be. Um, if you go to Rockin' Study Guide page, if you're not a member, Shauna, um, definitely send a request, answer the questions, and I'll, we'll, I'll bring you in. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, but they're doing a, they're What was doing the name again? Rockin' Study Group. Okay. They're doing, um, on, on, our, on our page, they're asking for questions for tomorrow night. And if, um, they're doing a lot of Q&A stuff. So if you have something that you're struggling with, with philosophy, and you might want to throw a spare on design since you weren't there last week, which is fine with me. If they're willing to answer it, they probably will. Um, put it down there, because they're preparing for tomorrow already, and um, that kind of helps bring everything together. Um, we probably will jump back into the Cooper next week, because um, like, like I told you guys before and, and last week, I don't mind giving up my study time for special guests. Um, cause there's so many of us doing so many wonderful things. I don't want to take, I don't want anybody to, you know, lose their spot, lose their time. So I, I rather sacrifice and have other people, but, um, but that's also another thing too. Um, we have a lot of study sessions throughout the week. If you can make them, um, I record mine. So if you're busy, life catches up with you cause it happens. Mine are recorded. So just send me, um, Hey Patrick, I, I got this going on if you can't make it and I'll just, I'll send you a copy. Um, I also po post all my PowerPoints and study guides that I make week to week. I try to put it all out there. I hope this helps me pass my test. I hope it does. If not, I'm gonna be really, really frustrated for both of us. <laughs> I put a lot of work in, but it's worth it. It really is. But um, I really appreciate you guys. I really do. And I'm gonna see y'all tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, Site Core, guys. I'll see y'all later. Bye, guys.